morning, beloved. It's good to see everybody on this nice, hot August 17th day, day in which we're celebrating our risen Savior. And uh, we'll have to give a, a shout out to all the daddies in here. Let me see the hands of the daddies. One, two, three. Happy Father's Day to you. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 6 tells us that children's children are the crown of old men. And listen to this. And the glory of children are their fathers. And beloved, our glory is our Father. Praise God. I, I saw we're not preaching on daddies today. We're preaching on Christ. Uh, John chapter 6. If you will, with the help of the Spirit of Truth, we're going to pick up there today. John chapter 6. Gospel of John, 6th chapter. Gospel of John, chapter 6. Now, we're going to read a parable here that Christ has given. And uh, a lot of folks couldn't hear it, didn't want to hear it. And a lot of folks use this passage to teach that you must take communion. Uh, the, and, and somehow the, the taking of the bread and the wine, it, it miraculously turns into the body and the blood of Christ. And that you have to do that in order to be saved. That's not what Jesus is teaching here. Um, but Jesus is using a, an analogy of a physical act to explain a spiritual truth. And uh, we'll go back and use Christ's teachings to, to get the explanation of what it is he's trying to tell them. With the help of the Spirit of Truth, beginning in John chapter 6, we're going to pick up where Christ is teaching. Verse 44, beginning in verse 44. John 6, beginning in verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Three big things there that you, you should glean from those two passages. Father got to draw you. you. You have to hear. You have to learn. Then you can come. Okay. Uh, verse 46 says, Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. This is going to be your key verse to this whole passage we're about to read today. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life, Christ said. And you know what's funny? You know what Bethlehem stands for, where Christ is from? The house of bread. That's what Bethlehem, that's what the name stands for, the house of bread. I am, he says, that bread of life. Verse 49, your fathers did eat men in the wilderness and they're dead. They ate food that was good for this life, and they're dead. He says in verse 50, This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. And he's not saying that you may not die physically, but this is that bread that offers life everlasting. They ate manna, and they died. That bread was, was good for then, for the, for the now, for the, for, the, for the earth. The bread he's offering is for the everlasting, and for now. But for the everlasting as well is what he's emphasizing here. Verse 51, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. He's talking about his sacrifice that he's going to offer up himself. And he gives it for the life of the whole world. Not that the whole world got saved by that, but the whole world could be if they turned to Christ. He's sufficient for everybody, whomsoever will, whomsoever will. He says in verse 52, The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? See, they had ears. They, they were hearing what he was saying, but they, they weren't grasping at all what it was he was telling them. And they were getting stirred and they were getting angered by this. And you can tell it as the passage goes on. Even his own disciples got mad at him, got under, got, got offended. It's offensive. The gospel is offensive. Christ does it all. We're insignificant. We receive the gift. There's nothing you can do to earn it. That just goes against everything selfish, prideful man has going for him. But bless God, those of us that see, those of us that hear, it's a beautiful truth. Amen. He said, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? 
Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Help us, Father God, in the blessed name of Jesus. Teach us for the spirit of truth. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He goes on and says that whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. Another key phrase there, I in him. As the living Father hath sent, sent me, and I live by the Father, as he, that, so he that eateth me, so even so, he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Now he's just told them they got to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And you're fixing to tell that they were appalled by this. They were offended. And, and, and he goes on and tells them, look, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Not so much necessarily that they didn't understand what it was he was saying. It was offensive to them. We've got to consume your flesh. We've got to eat your flesh. Christ says, he tells them he's not speaking of his literal flesh. He goes on and tells them in verse 61 and 62. He says, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? He said, he's telling them, I'm going to ascend up where I was before, so you can't very, very well eat my flesh and drink my blood. What is he talking about? What has what led up to this teaching that he's doing? We have to go back in the Gospel of John. If you'll back up to the... Uh, well, let, let's look at the beginning of chapter 6. When Jesus is feeding the, the multitude of 5,000, and he's feeding them with the, 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 five, the five barley loaves and the two small fishes, and he feeds 5,000 people. And you know, he knew that they were going to try to take him by force and make him the king right then and there. So what did he do? He left them. He left them and he sailed, he sailed across the water to get away from them. But they ran to him. They ran to him following him. And he told them in verse 26 of, of John chapter 6, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not. Because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled, or because your fleshly needs were, were taken care of. In other words, he said, you didn't, you're not coming to me because I did a miracle. You're coming because you got your bellies full. And you're coming looking for more of your fleshly sustenance. And that's what's, led, that's what's led up in this teaching. Actually, even precedes that. It goes back. It goes on back to John chapter four, which we'll probably wind up getting to, which is leading to this very teaching that he's having with these people right now. That the whole book of John is a beautiful illustration of the work of the gospel of Christ. Uh, it's, it's just a beautiful picture. Yes, there's a lot of parables, a lot of analogies using, because for you it is given to understand these things, but to those that, that, are, that are not given to them, beloved, to understand the words of the Lord is blessing, truly indeed, because you have to have the Spirit of God to understand the words of the Lord. People will read this, like so many churches, they will read that passage and, and say, well, well, Christ sat down at the Last Supper, and they break bread and they drank wine, but they didn't eat his literal flesh. And, there, and he in no way led them to think that, by, that his body was literally going to be turned into that wine, into that unleavened bread. Unleavened bread and that wine represented what he did, the covenant. But that's, you, by you partaking of any communion supper, you're not getting eternal life by doing that. That's not what he's saying in this passage. That's not what he's talking about. We do communion. We'll take the Lord's Supper. We'll do it and honor him. It's not something we do every weekend. It's not something we do every month. It's not something we do every time we meet. Because it's the emphasis should be on Christ and the work he did at Calvary, not on anything else. We preach Christ crucified. What is the salvation? What, what leads people to salvation? The preaching of the cross. The gospel of Christ. That's what the emphasis is, okay? That's what the emphasis is supposed to be. 
Too many churches, it's not. But that's what emphasis is supposed to be. Christ told them that you come and looking for me because you got full. You got your belly full. He tells them in verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Now, they asked him in verse 28, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Because he just told them, Labor not for the meat that's going to perish, that's going to rot, but labor for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. And they said, Well, what do we got to do? What do we got to do? He tells them in verse 29, And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. What's the work of God? Believe. On him whom he has sent. They still wouldn't get it. Still couldn't hear. Christ told them, labor not for the meat which perisheth. Now we know you got to work for your food. Right? The Bible says if any man won't provide for his family, he's worse than an infidel. If a sluggard, if you won't roll over, if you won't pick up your hand, Proverbs tells us, put it in your mouth, you're going to die. People are that lazy. They won't roll over in the bed to stick a spoonful of food in their mouth because they're that lazy. The harvest can be out there and they won't go pick it. They'll let it rot. Those people will starve to death in the times we were reading about this morning. You've got to learn to be thankful for every little thing you got and eat every little thing you got. Not be so picky. Be thankful about it at all times. But, but he's not talking about food. He says in John chapter 4, John chapter 4, in verse 34, in John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Because he had just told them they, they wanted him to eat. And uh, he said in verse 32, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And his disciples said, did he put some food away? Did somebody else bring some food to him? He said, my meat is to do the will of him that has sent me. So if Christ tells you to labor, not for that meat that perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, it is to labor, it is, it is to, to set your affections on the things that God would have you concerned with. The words of the Lord. That's the meat. That's the bread of life he's talking about. He goes on and says, in verse 30, they, they want to see another miracle. They said unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? They want to see miracles. People are like that today. If there ain't something big taking place, they don't believe. They, they just, they want, they want, they just, they, they want to see things. They want experiences. They want to feel things. Your body is deceptive. Your body is a deceiver. Your flesh is your enemy. So if it's something you're feeling, if it's something you're seeing, you can't trust what you see or what you're feeling. you got to trust what is spoken, what is written. That's what you trust, right? Our affections on heavenly things. We set our affections on things above, not on things on this earth. So if anything is moving or stirring and it, and it could be of God and it may not be of God, that's what, but you don't put your stake and your faith there. Here's where you ground your faith. And if somebody can, can spout off a few words, beloved, but if they're not giving you the Bible, one verse with a whole lot of mess, it, the devil uses Scripture, right? The devil uses Scripture. Paul warned that, that Satan's ministers, his angels, they were going to transform themselves under, under ministers of light. They were going to be behind the pulpits deceiving people too. They're after money. They're after money. Pass around the hat. Throw your money up here. Let me see it. Throw it in here. They want your money. People want your money. It's a, it's a, it's a job for them. And some of them are very lucrative. Some of them are very good at it. Christ is not talking about food. He's not talking about anything that you can do, in any kind of money. They want to see a miracle. Christ answered them in verse uh, verse 31, they go on and said, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Christ said, Then Jesus answered unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Moses didn't give you that bread. It come from Christ. He said, My Father. And you watch Christ is, is, is fixing to disassociate himself from the people he's talking to when he says, Your fathers. Your father's. That's another. He's, he's, he's putting himself as he's showing his deity to them. Even though he's from the stock of Israel, he's not claiming to be from them. He's claiming to be from his father. He separates himself from them. Everything he did just poked them in the eyes. Every time they turned around. Because they had their head up in the air. 
They felt real good about themselves. They, felt they were real haughty, full of works, full of works. But it wasn't, it wasn't working because they were saved, was it? It was working. They, they, were, they were saved because they were working, so they thought. Christ says, verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. How does he give life unto the world? His death brings life. His birth was for his death. His death was for our birth. His death brings life. He said the true bread is he which came down. We know that's Christ. Right? God manifested in the flesh. In the, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was God. Right? The, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He, He, Christ said, the one He's describing, Him that comes down from heaven, He is the true bread of life, and He giveth life unto the world. Verse 34, Then said they unto Him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Wow. And in verse 36, it says, But I said unto you that you also have seen me, and yet, Believe not, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And we remember what he just had, had told us in John 4, that that's the meat. That that's meat indeed, is the will of his Father. That that's meat. Now you should already start seeing a picture of what Christ is talking about when he says eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He's not talking about eating his literal body and drinking his literal blood. But at the same time, beloved, as you take and partake of your breakfast this morning or your lunch this evening, when you eat that food and you drink that drink behind you, it goes inside you and it becomes a part of your body then. In the same way as Christ, when you partake of him, when you invite him into your life, he comes inside you. He told us he was going to dwell in us and he becomes a part of your body as well. So in that sense, yes. But he's not talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But he does come a part of our lives just like the food you stuck in there this morning. Okay? But it's going to be gone. He never will. He never will. Verse 38. I came down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him that sent me and this is the Father's will. Listen to the Father's will. His will means his intentions, his desire, God's purpose. This is what God would desire. This is what God will. This is what God would intend to be done. This is God's will. Listen to what he says. This is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So what's God's will? He wants us to have everlasting life. He wants us to see the Son and believe on him. That's what God wants. That's what God would have. But see, when you take God out of schools and when you take God out of the classrooms, when you take God out of the workplace, when you take God out of the public spectrums, when you take God out of sporting events, when you take God out of the churches, as so many of them are doing, as so many of them are doing, how can people see the Son, believe, and be saved? Because the Father has to draw you. You get rid of the Father, you got no draw. Right? Verse 41, the Jews, they then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother that we know? How is it then that he saith, I come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. And then he, he, he picks up again where we started this at. Don't mouth among yourselves. No man can come except the father draw him. He'll cool, drags. Drags literally means to drag. Because you know the nature of man is to want to do righteousness and to walk right and to, to, to serve God. No. He drags you through the Spirit of God. Christ tells them in verse 55, He says, For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Right? He says, 
His flesh is meat indeed. He said in John chapter 4 verses 32 through 34 that his meat was to do the will of God. So if he's ascribing his meat to the will of God and he's telling us that he wants us to eat his meat, eat his flesh, what's he telling us he wants us to do? His will. Believe. Love. Believe in love. He says that, that his blood is drink indeed. Re remember what he told the little Samaritan woman at the well in John 14, verse 14. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And we know that in John 7, the well, the water he's talking about, the Spirit. He's talking about the Spirit. He says in him... Uh, John 7, 38 and 39, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. It's the whole thing, the whole teaching in John. He goes on and says it in verse 63. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. It is the Spirit that give life. He says the flesh profit is nothing. You can't eat Him and get nothing out of Him is what He's telling them. It's the Spirit that quickeneth that gives life. That's why He asked them, what and if you see this body ascend up from where He came before? You ain't eating this body. But He's using a, a, a physical analogy to teach them a spiritual truth which they couldn't see or rather wouldn't receive. They understood it. Most of them understood it. When you do the original translation of that Greek where they said this is a hard saying, it's, it's more like uh, this is an offensive doctrine. You're, this is offensive. Remember how we had the message on the teaching on the blood. People don't even like you to say the blood. But yet it's by the blood of Christ. It's only by the blood that you're going to be saved. Amen. But they didn't like to hear this either. They didn't want to hear they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood. You have to consume every bit of his being. You have to take the Word of God and digest it. Every bit of it. Not one track. Every book from Genesis to Revelation. Not the page you don't like. You don't tear that out and throw it away. Every bit of it. Every bit of it. Because He is the Word of God. Amen. And you've got to drink it. You've got to eat it. It's the living water. It's the bread of life. And He said if you eat of Him, you'll never be hungry. And if you drink of Him, you'll never be thirsty. And beloved, even today, in the physical need, he takes care of all those things too, Matthew 6 tells us, right? Don't labor, don't, don't, don't worry for things you can't do nothing about. The Lord's going to take care of your needs. You don't need to worry about your clothes, what you're going to wear. You don't need to worry about your food, what you're going to eat. He'll take care of you. That don't mean you sit back like the baby birds in the nest. You, you, you go get it. He'll put it out there for you. He's not telling them not to work. He's not telling them not to do anything. He's just telling them they need to eat his flesh and drink his blood and this rubbed them the wrong way. Because they did, and once again, like most of the things he ever taught them, he taught them in parables. So why? Seeing they might see and not understand and hearing they may hear and not perceive. That's, that's why. He knew who it was he was dealing with and those same people are, are out there in the world today. And they'll read this right now and they'll get, well, we've got to take communion in order to be saved. Because somehow, miraculously, this bread and this wine is going to turn into the body and the blood of Jesus. That's not what he's saying. That is not what he's telling them. Not at all. The key is where we started. Verse 47. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. When he says that you eat his, eat his flesh and you drink his blood, you, you have life everlasting. He said that he that believeth. So here's, here it is in a nutshell. He that believeth has eaten. I said he that believeth has eaten. You eat when you believe. When you believe, you're eating. You're partaking of that root, of, of, of that, that good root, of, of the fatness and the gladness of that good tree. You're, you're taking of it when you believe. And, and you're built up by the things that you receive, by the things you're eating. The Word of God. The flesh. He's not talking about his literal flesh. His literal flesh was ascended back into heaven, right? He showed up to his disciples, touch me, feel me. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the earth. Flesh and blood cannot. He, he sat there and ate with them. You can't touch a spirit. Touch me. Put your hands here. Poke me in the side. He's let them know he was physical body. was resurrected in heaven. He wasn't talking about you eating his physical body. He wasn't talking about any communion cake or any wine or grape juice was going to be his blood or his body. That's not what he was saying. We do this in remembrance of him. In remembrance of what he did. There's no power. There's no saving force in communion or in that bread. 
and drinking the wine. You believe me? It's a fact. I know that's going to rub a lot of people wrong. But there's a lot of people that will take communion and, and, and they'll, they'll eat the bread and drink the wine every time they meet. Just use it every day. But say the same old little chant over and over again in a language you don't understand. And by your, by your doings, by your work, you're saving yourself. When Christ said, the work of the Father is to believe on Him. The work of the Father is to believe on Him. Verse 63, he said, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You cannot have life until you are born again. He said in John 3 that you must be born of the water and of the spirit. You must be born of the spirit. You must be born from above in order to have new life. You have to have the spirit of God indwelling in you in order to have life. The flesh profiteth nothing. Not his physical flesh at that time. Now we know what his physical flesh purchased. But his flesh he was talking about at that time, or ours, profiteth nothing. It's the spirit that quickeneth. In other words, you can't work to do any single thing to secure yourself any place in eternity. No matter what you do, this flesh can't profit you nothing. But the spirit, the spirit giveth life. It is the spirit that quickeneth, he said, gives life. He says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. So what's he saying? The Spirit gives you life. The words that He speaks are spirit. So what should you be digesting? We know that He is the bread of life. He is the Word of, of, of life, that, the Word of God. What should you be consuming? Him. How, how do you consume Him? Right here. Right here. Through the Word. Through exactly what Brother Kent was teaching this morning. Not, not your favorite part. Not your favorite part with the exclusion of the stuff you don't like or that you don't understand. If you don't understand a matter, search it out. Amen. Search it out. Be a Berean. If you don't understand the matter, ask the Father. He'll teach you. He doesn't upbraid anybody. He's not a toner. He's not going to taunt you. If you come to Him looking for answers, He'll give you answers. Amen. But you have to come looking for answers. If you just take some at face value, I don't know how many times people have read that. And, and see, it just kept coming up, this, this verse. Because I've heard people misquote it and, read, and, and ask about it because they were confused. What are you talking about? But if you go back to where he started in, in this teaching, in John chapter 4 up to this point, you can see what he's talking about. He's already given living water out, offered it to, to the Samaritan lady at the well. He's already talked about his meat being, being the will of God. He's already told us that, that the will of God is for everybody to be saved, that the work of God is to you to believe. He tells us in this very passage, he that believeth hath everlasting life. He makes it way more clear that it is the Spirit that gives us this new life and that there's nothing the flesh can do. He makes it completely crystal clear for those with eyes to see and ears to hear. And yet it's amazing how many people will pass over this passage and, and not relate. Well, see, the chapter and verses sometimes hurt people. The chapters and verses were not in the original Greek. They were not there. Chapters and verses were added for our ease. So we can say, turn to chapter 4 and verse 20, and we're going to begin reading there. But that doesn't really mean that the story started there. It started back in John 4. From, from the, and then up to the feeding of the multitude, the 5,000, with, with the five barley loaves and, and, and the, the, the two fish. That, that's what led up to this whole teaching he's teaching now. They're looking for sustenance for their flesh. People are today looking for sustenance for their flesh. He's told us, don't worry about things of the flesh. I've got that covered for you already. That's a given when you come to me. The flesh will be taken care of. That's a given when you come to me. Let go of the flesh. And set your affection on, on things, mind heavenly things. Set your affection on heavenly things, because the flesh is took care of already. They got mad. They didn't like what he had to tell them. They didn't like what they had. Anytime you tell somebody, anytime you tell prideful men that there's nothing he can do, it rubs them wrong. It just goes against their, their grain. There's nothing you can do. Now, let me do something. There's nothing you can do. I got to do something. I want, why do you got to? Who do I want to? Why? Why do you got to? Oh, because it make you feel better about yourself. Right? There's nothing we can do. It's done for us. We can't add to His work, can we? We can't add to nothing He's done for us. It's a done deal. He goes on and tells them in verse 64, But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed, believed not and who should betray Him. He knew. 
He knew the whole time. You remember when the disciples were sitting around wondering who it was going to trespass against him? They didn't know by outward acts of the flesh. Because they were all saying, is it I, Lord? Is, is it I? Is it me? They didn't know. But Jesus knew who it was going to be. He knew from before the beginning of the creation of the world. And he knew from the beginning of his earthly ministry here as the man sent here to be sacrificed and die for us. He knew in either occasion. He knew who it was. He knew who was going to betray him. 65, he says... And this he said, and he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and they walked no more with him. They forsook him. They left him. They left him for either because they, the doctrine he was teaching was offensive to them about eating the flesh or drinking the blood. They either took it as a literal thing that he wanted them to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Or the fact that he was telling them that without him and w without the life that he gives, they were going to have no life. Whatever the reason, they got mad and they were offended and they left him. And they didn't walk no more with him. Verse 67, then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Now watch, thou hast the meat and the drink. Thou hast... The words of eternal life. Now he's closing up this whole teaching with what he's been saying. With the same way that he opens it up. He, you have the words of eternal life. He's telling us the key to everlasting life. The everlasting life, the key to it, is in the words of the Lord. The will of God. Right? He also said that if you were to know the will of God, you were to know the doctrine. Christ said, whether I speak of myself or somebody else. That's the will of God, to know the doctrine. So if you want to find this life everlasting, if you want to come and eat at that bread that gives everlasting life and drink at that water where you'll never thirst, all you need to do is sit down with the Word of God. Seek out the Spirit of truth. Ask the Father to teach you. And He will. He'll give you all you can handle to eat. He'll give you all you can handle to drink. Verse 69, He says, We believe... And we are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is the devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Now, I love the way Christ teaches in parables. Now, I, it, would, it would be frustrating to be somebody that can't see and somebody that can't hear. But being a child of God, it's crystal clear what he's talking about if you just take a look at what it is he's saying. So many times we'll read passive passages like that that we initially don't understand and we'll leave it alone and we don't venture no more into it. But it's not complicated theology at all. He's telling you what it is that you must do to eat and to drink. It's his words. you got to believe. You have to hear. You have to learn to come. And you only hear. The faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You only come by the gift that's given to you. It's all a gift done by him. The spirit that's given to us. Everything that we need is a gift. It's a gift. Yeah, you, you come. But you can't come unless you're called. So even your coming is, is not anything initiated by you. He does it. He initiates the calling. He provides the means. And he sustains all at the same time. You want bread that'll never run out? You want drink where you'll never thirst? Seek him out. John, he said it in John 7. We were told... He spoke of the Spirit. The living water, he was speaking of the Spirit. He's not speaking of anything else. I don't know how many times I hear people talking about that passage. What gift is that Christ was talking about giving somebody? He was talking about sending his Spirit to you. Because he, the Spirit, the Comforter, is going to be the one that teaches us all things which he has said. How does he teach us all things which he has said? It is written. It is written. And he teaches you. From here, as you read the words of God, the spirit of truth, the spirit of God, he is telling you what it is that you're reading. You have not need that a man teach you. He'll teach you. But you've got to be reading. You've got to read. Even the hard things, even the things we don't like. He is the bread of life. He is that drink indeed. Drink up. You without money, come by, he says in Isaiah 55. It, do, it doesn't matter. In, in, in the book of Revelation, I, I'm going to give you to, to eat and, and to drink the river of life freely. 
there's nothing, there's nothing in this life, and, and as, as bad as things look at times, there's nothing in this life that a child of God has not already overcome through the, the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. There's nothing in this life that we need get get hooked up on or, or get too involved with. Brother opened up there, we're talking about it during our praise service. Now, the sourness, the, the, the sourness, the ill attitudes, it's repulsive to God the Father. And it should be repulsive to you. And, and if you're a child of God, and another child of God is, is being sour, man, you need to love, love on them some. They need some love in the worst possible way. Because there's really nothing to be sour about. Is there? Nothing to be sour about. Every single thing that, that we have been told is coming to tuition. It's, com it's, it's coming in front of our face. We're seeing it take place. We're seeing prophecy line up. We're, we're seeing steps being taken right now to usher in the return of Christ Jesus as the King of King and Lord of Lords, which He is. And He's coming to reclaim His spot, to claim His place. And we're living in this time. Yeah, there's a lot of death fixing to happen. Yeah, there's a lot of war. There's a lot of bad times. There's a lot of things that's taking place in our very own states and counties and different places that we live throughout the world. But it's all for His glory. It's all for His glory. And if we're, desire, if we're desiring the things that are above, if we're setting our affection on heavenly things, then we could care less about losing the, the, the house or the senate or anything else. We should be caring about God's will being fulfilled. Christ said three times, nevertheless, Father, not my will but thine. He, he, he would have just assumed he didn't have to face that rejection by the Father. But not my will, thine. Same thing, beloved. Yes, we don't want to see the nation go to pot, but at the same time, not our will, Father, but your Hallelujah. Eat the bread of life. Drink. Drink the drink. This, that he said it in John 55. My flesh is meat indeed, and my blood, drink indeed. Meat indeed, drink it. Drink it, eat it, consume it. As you put that morsel of food into your body and it goes inside you, do the same thing. Put the Word of God deep down inside you. Sow those seeds in there. And God will yield increases. He'll pull it up when He wants it coming out of you when you need it. Beloved, sow the seeds in you because this Word's what you've got to stand by. When they take away this Word, and I'm talking about your physical book, when they take away this book, what are you going to do? What are you going to do when you have nothing to fall on? If you can't sit there without reading it like Sister Maria and finish scriptures then something's wrong you should have got enough reading in while you could see like our sister did or else when it comes that time to stand on the word of God what are you going to do you're going to be offended you're going to be offended too we're going to leave like his disciples did and won't go back and some of them didn't follow him no more that's what will happen Unless the Word of God is in us. Drink His blood, eat His flesh indeed. He's not talking about in a literal sense. He's using physical analogies to teach them a spiritual truth. And it all gets back to the same thing from Genesis to Revelation. It's believe on Him. Believe on Him. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. When you're receiving Him, when you're consuming Him, when you're eating His body and drinking His blood, you're, you're hearing Him, you're trusting in Him, you're believing Him, you're obeying Him. All those things. You're obeying. You're doing all those things. And that's, uh, uh, I know that was a, a, a real roundabout way to, to say that, but it doesn't matter. From Genesis to Revelation, the same thing is Christ, the Messiah, He saves. He saves and only Him. There's nothing you can do. Nothing you can do. And the only way you come to that is hearing and learning. You hear of Him and you learn of Him. That's how you come. It ain't fast food. It ain't fast food. Salvation of the soul is instantaneous. Preparation of the soul takes time. So just because people come to church a few times, just because people say this or say that, don't mean anything. You need to get your people, you need to get your family in church. I asked Wednesday night for everybody to invite somebody. I seen no new faces. Matter of fact, we got people that left this morning to go somewhere else. It is sad. It's disheartening. Beloved, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. It, at Living Waters? Or at any place on this earth. God's looking for somebody to start stepping up. 
God's looking for you to start doing the work of the ministry. And I'm not talking about Brother Charlie and Brother Kent. They got enough too. We got to start doing the job we're told to do. Period. Because there's nothing here everlasting. Nothing here. Everything here is temporary. Everything here is temporary. God can move one of us just like he moved me from East Tennessee, West Carolina to Alabama. It happens that fast. God don't want you nowhere here forever. We've got a forever coming. This ain't it. This life ain't it. People get too comfy with their surroundings. Eat his blood, drink his blood, eat his flesh, indeed. And you shall never be hungry, and you shall never thirst. And if y'all don't understand what was just said, it's a simple, a child could understand. I'm, I'm not trying to belittle nobody. If you don't understand it, please seek me after church. Ask Brother Kent, ask Brother Charlie, ask some of your elder women what it was that just got said. Because in layman's term, in a nutshell, to paraphrase it very poorly, read your Bibles. Read your Bible and believe what you're reading. Read, it always gets back to reading your Bibles. How many of you read your Bible every day? Every day since the last time we've met. How many of you read your Bible every day? Amen. I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to see hands because for those of you that hadn't, they'll be ashamed. And you should be because I know for a fact you have ate physical food every day. Right? Amen. So if you've ate spirit, physical food every day, you should be eating spiritual food every day. There's no excuse. We got even if you even if you rushed and you can only get a little bit in, that should be your a goal before the day's out. Whatever time that, that that happens, read your Bibles and ask the Spirit of Truth to teach you, because He's indwelling in you. He will teach you all things, and that is a well, that is a source, an epi, a, a a supply that springs up into life everlasting. Do you notice it springeth up into life everlasting? That's why the hearing and the learning is a necessity. In the blessed name of Jesus. Questions or comments? I know that was short before we pray. Well, anybody 